we'll go to Ms. Finke. Go ahead. Thanks. I, mean, I think everything that's been mentioned here is totally right on. <laughs> uh, meeting people where they're at is really important. Meeting students where they're at is important. So we, we talk about this in Mental Health a lot, like a no wrong doors approach. And I think that's that's totally right. And, and also no wrong doors approach uh, along and a continuum of care, right? So from prevention, earlier I mentioned, doing the screenings, uh, as were mentioned, and then also when it gets to sort of crisis care and, and dealing with some of the more acute needs, um, making sure that we have, you know, both an, an, like an open door and an entryway in, and then and then also that that door leads to services and leads to access to care, um, making sure that people really get placed into the appropriate supports. Um, you know, I will mention today is the the one year anniversary of Uvalde. And I think we've seen a lot of stats come out on, um, you know, what kind of happens to a community um, and, and students when, they, when they're dealing with significant trauma. We know that it's individual, we know it's collective, we know that it's structural, um, but there's been a lot of studies that have just recently been released about, you know, kind of the need for what happened, like what, what the needs are in, 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 you know, communities that have been affected by these sorts of things. So I think, you know, it was there was a study by every town that recently found that 32% of people who have been affected by um, you know some of these acts of violence expressing for mental health services, 25% for peer support, 14% for legal support, 12% for like logistics and financial and sort of other supports. And I think those things really match up with what we understand when people are really struggling, that they really need access to mental health support, that they really need access to peers and people who look like them and are coming from their same background and helping them. And so, you know, when I hear uh, Christine and Dolores speak, it really is, uh, you know, about meeting people where they're at and making sure that the people that are meeting them understand their need and can get them connected to appropriate services. Um, I've got, and unfortunately, as um, uh, host, whatever, chair, however, whatever my role is, um, I, I have to be cognizant of the time. So I'm going to move us along uh, to the next category. And, and I had some prepared comments, but I'm going to skip over them because, again, um, what you all are sharing and, and discussing is vitally important. I want your voices to be heard, not mine. I, I want to move to the issue that Lauren, you just ended on, and actually, uh, Dr. Sengupta, you also referenced early on in a slightly different context. And, and um, this time around, I'm, I'm going to ask the question with an answer, uh, hopefully first coming from Dr. Sengupta because of your work. I, I, want, I want us to discuss the issue of the shortage of mental health professionals. Um, you know, what What are some of the underlying reasons for this shortage? Um, what can be done to recruit, train uh, those who are needed, but also the absolute necessity for there to be more diversity in the professions so as to reach those in communities, uh, specifically communities of color, but also those that are uh, under-resourced communities, uh, but yes, again, specifically communities of color where services are severely lacking and um, and the need is for professionals who uh, are able to connect with uh, those who need the help. Um, so Dr. Sagupta, if you'd like to start us off, please do so. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I mean, a, a myriad of upstream issues likely that are um, contributing to our workforce shortage. Um, you know, some of them related to kind of, you know, you know, historic stigma related to mental health and, um, you know, kind of mental illness uh, around marginalized populations that are struggling with emotional health challenges. Um, and in that, in that context, you know, this is not necessarily a profession that, you know, kind of pays at par, you know, compared to other helping professions. Um, and, and, and I think that, you know, individuals are certainly within their right to kind of understand that, you know, hey, I, I need to support myself, I need to support my family in that context. Is this an occupation that can allow me to do so? Um, and, and I think that's critically important. Um, you know, in this context, uh, you know, the pandemic has impacted so many things in the mental health field, but among them is, you know, a lot of, um, you know, obviously demand and pent up demand for mental health providers. And, you know, I, I'll, I'll just speak for us in Western New York, you know, we've seen a lot of, you know, providers move, um, you know, from, you know, one agency to another. 
you know, and, and as someone who's, I'm, I'm a bit more on the institutional side, you know, I'll admit sometimes it's super challenging. Like, I, I don't know if my kids are going to be able to keep working with their therapists, you know, longer term, these kinds of things. On the other hand, you know, I completely understand and appreciate it, right? Um, you know, it, you know, if, if we continue to sort of have a society that's structured under kind of market, you know, sort of forces in that context, then, you know, when someone has the opportunity to make a, a more appropriate living, you know, I, I understand there's going to be a movement there. And correspondingly, there, there, you know, there has to be and there, there is and there will be, you know, um, a bump in their salaries. Um, but, but I don't know, to me, this is one of those situations where you have a big societal need. Um, you know, the market doesn't necessarily do a great job of responding to big societal needs, especially when it involves, you know, caring for folks that are kind of more vulnerable and marginalized. And that ties into the representation piece, right? Um, you know, there may not be very many, you know, more marginalized groups than, you know, uh, folks of color, you know, that are struggling with mental health challenges. Um, and to you know, have, you know, um, a reasonable representation in the workforce of folks, you know, again, I, I work in largely an urban sitting and uh, urban setting in Buffalo, you know, um, my black boy and girl patients would love to work with a therapist that looks like them, you know, and, um, and I don't have that, you know, luxury as a, as a clinician to be able to connect them to that. Um, and, and that's, uh, that's an indictment on all of us and, and our society and our structure. Um, and our training things, our training systems. Um, so this is something where I think we have to go way, way back, way, way, way upstream. You know, this isn't even just, you can't even start with a high school program. You've got to start, you know, up in, you know, preschool and elementary school talking about the importance of mental health, you know, introducing them to mental health heroes um, that represent, you know, their culture and communities um, and really, really encouraging, supporting um, and, and standing by them as they make this, you know, kind of move into a different professional sphere. Um, you know, this is not a space to stand on professionalism and tell them to change their hairstyle. That's not okay. You know, this is not a, a space to talk about, um, you know, needing to recruit folks, but not paying them. Um, you know, we've, we've got to do it all. Um, and, and we can walk and chew gum at the same time, I think. Yeah, thank you. Um, it, it, the, the need, I think, and that's why we have advocated as a union uh, aggressively and had some marginal success. We've got some legislation in, in the New York State Legislature right now. Um, and it is, it's not far enough upstream, as you were saying, uh, but it would create uh, a mental health education opportunity program built on that successful EOP program. And the idea is to recruit and retain those who are going into education for the purposes of being trained to enter the mental health uh, professions. Uh, we need that diversity. Uh, and it's also why, um, you know, same circumstances that you know so well being from Buffalo, it is why we had the previous panel in October and it's why we did it in Buffalo because we're just past uh, another terrible uh, anniversary for, on May 14th on the east side of Buffalo uh, with the racist terrorist attack there. Um, I uh, Let's see. Um, Dr. Golden, you're you're uh, unmuted. Why don't you go ahead first, and then I'll go to you, John. Um, I was going to just add to that as well that if you look at the bigger picture in terms of workforce, just across New York State, many of the nonprofit organizations are the ones who are delivering mental health services outside of university settings, and they had a very strong advocacy effort over the last couple of years to try to get a cost of living increase. Uh, to their programs. One of the interesting things, now they did get one last year and they did get one this year, not as much as they should have or what was being advocated for. But you know, one of the challenges that doesn't make it into the public eye is that when they get a cost of living increase for specific programs, they may have 10 programs within that nonprofit that are all serving individuals that have mental health needs. But if only three of those programs get funding, those are the only three that get the cost of living increase. So that nonprofit is now saddled with, how do we give the rest of our staff the same increase so that we don't create additional inequities? And those inequities then create even more difficulty with recruitment and trying to retain people. Uh, a process we've been going through at Stony Brook for the last, I would say four or five months, almost coming to a closure, is looking at how we as a university can produce more workforce. What do we need to do 
to be able to encourage people to go into the fields and uh, enter into the field of mental health. So, you know, there are many challenges to that, recruiting faculty, the salaries, there's a, a whole host of reasons why that becomes difficult, but there are also things that we can do at the state level. There are regulations that prevent physician assistants from practicing in certain mental health programs. There are things that we trip ourselves up with and if they can't practice in that field, then why would they want to go into the field of mental health if they want to remain in New York State? So at a legislative level, there are things that we can do to loosen certain regulatory burden to enable people to practice at the top of their license. And um, those are some of the things that we're trying to look at now, in addition to how do we increase enrollment and how do we... Uh, how do we work with more students? How do we find more clinical placements? How do we engage the School of Nursing with the School of Medicine, with the School of Social Welfare? How do we get them to all work together to uh, you know, create more effective um, clinical placements to produce workforce? Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Christy. Uh, John. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to pick up on Dr. Golden's comments about the you know the the cost of living adjustment. Um, we asked for eight point five percent this year because it, you know that matched inflation just to keep pace with um, you know inflationary factors. But we're looking at thirty three percent colas that we were promised and didn't get in past years. So we're starting off in a bad place. Um, we ended up with something like a four point five percent cola. Um, but at the same time, you know, the governor proposed a uh, billion dollars in this year's budget for mental health, which is unbelievable. It's unprecedented and it's fantastic. The problem is, is that most of that money is to expand various programs, inpatient beds, to expand um, housing opportunities and outpatient and inpatient services. And we just don't have the staff to expand those programs. People aren't going to be responding to the RFPs because um, they, they don't have the staff. Uh, a lot of the, uh, our affiliates are looking at 30 and 40% uh, staff vacancies already. So, you know, it's a huge issue to address the overall workforce and their, and their, co their costs. Uh, and then some of the other reasons we're seeing an out migration um, of psychiatrists. I, the the look, stat I looked at today was 60% of psychiatrists now are 55 and older. And I'm, I imagine that might also pertain to some of the other um, licensed categories. Um, and, and so that, that's a real issue. Um, Fred, you mentioned UUP's bill, you know, sort of a career ladder type bill. Mahaney's is promoting another piece of legislation that, that similar career ladders, you know, OMH proposed in the budget this year, uh, a new position for a qualified mental health, uh, associate. Um, and th these are all, these are all great ideas and things we need. I think the challenge there is the scope of practice issues, and we have to learn how to get along enough to be able to allow for some change that might be hard and uncomfortable, but uh, scope of practice changes is one of the ways that, that you know, we might be able to get there. So, yeah, yeah I'll leave yeah. that. Yeah. Thanks very much, John. Um, Lauren, you had your microphone unmuted. Did you want to close us out on this? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm hearing a few things that I think run close to home for the Kennedy Forum and what we do a lot of in our advocacy, which is you know, when we think about workforce, we think about what it looks like to take care of the existing workforce, what it looks like to grow, you know, sort of the workforce to sort of support the existing ones so that they can, you know, work to their license and do their job and not have to worry about doing, you know, 800 <laughs> people's jobs at the same time. And then also what it looks like to sort of build that pipeline. So when we think about taking care of the workforce, we think about investing mental health resources for staff, ensuring health insurance covers the medically necessary mental health and addiction care that they need for employees so that they can take care of themselves, they can take care of their families, um, you know, growing the existing workforce. I know we already talked about using peer supports, but a lot of states have done really great work about um, around really growing peer supports, and, and New York is one of those, and I think there's room for growth there, too. Um Christy mentioned maximizing, um, you know, the ability to work the license, increasing interstate licensing, flexibility agreements is a big one. Telehealth is a big one. Um, expanding state sanctioned consult lines so people who are working in the field sort of have expertise around them. That's been a big one. Um, and then in terms of building a better workforce, as uh, Dr. Sengupta said, uh, <laughs> introducing more, you know, 
people into the pipeline earlier, opportunities in high school, opportunities so that people know what it is like to, to enter into a career into the field early, early on, and then making sure that those programs are accessible to, if we want diversity in the workforce, we need to make sure that those programs aren't sort of locking people out and that we're meeting the, the kind of people that we want to be the face of, of you know, mental health care in this state, that we're really, really pushing um, for those barriers to be broken down. I think that's going to take some, you know, creative thinking and going out, you know, and, and hearing where those gaps are. I, I think there's, um, we often think we know where the gaps are, and then it turns out that there's, <laughs> you know, some other reasons why people aren't going to those pipelines. And I think there's a lot of other, you know, complicating factors, like I don't have child care, I don't have you know, all these things that I think we need to really be thinking about if we are really serious about making sure that our pipeline is diverse.